Well hello everybody and welcome to another video from the Canal Sidings Model Railway Channel. Um, once again I have to say, as I've said in the last couple of videos, um, I've not made much progress. And the reason is still these damn eBay sales. Um, I'm getting close now to finishing and getting rid of everything I want to sell. Um, but I've still got, uh, uh, what have I got? I've got a rake of mineral wagons to sell, about 20 of them I think. Might not be as many as that, but that sort of order. Um, and a rake of uh, six wheel milk wagons, milk, milk um, tankers to sell. Um, and I've also got um, some uh, bogey bolster wagons, etc. Uh, so there's quite a few more bits to go yet. And every time I look and think I'm finished, I find something else. So, um, as I say, it's a way to go yet. But at least I can now see the light at the end of the tunnel, no pun intended. Um, so, what actually have I been up to? Well, um, I've made a couple of acquisitions recently, which uh, are pushing me in a, a direction I never thought I would go in. And that is here. I have a class 150 in regional railways livery um, and it only occurred to me very recently that regional railways livery lasted as long as it did um, five six maybe seven years into privatization regional railways were still um, in evidence on coaching stock and a few locos um, and I was only watching a video which I've watched many times before and I always get new information from it every time I watch it um, which is one of the Duke series of videos um, video diaries um, they made about half a dozen of them I think and I've got all of them and the one I was watching was video diaries 2000 at crew and the first the first um, train that you see in the video is exactly this, a class 150 in regional railways livery. Um, and the commentator points out, still in regional railways livery. Didn't even say who it was operated by. Um, and the other thing that you saw at Crewe um, was the North Wales Coast Service to Holyhead which at that time was still loco hauled, almost exclusively, if not absolutely exclusively, by Class 37s. Um, and in that video, there was a rake of coaches which was on that service, and it consisted of um, three Mark 2A TSOs and one Mark 2A BFK, that's a break first, TSO is being tourist second open, um, and normally those trains are made of five coaches, that was four of them, the fifth coach was a chocolate and cream um, TSO, in Mark, uh, a Mark 1 chocolate and cream TSO. So it was quite a, 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 an interesting rake of coaches, and the loco of the day was a class 37, I think it was 37421. Um, and by that time that was in EWS livery. Um, I have, I think, 37421. I certainly have a 37 in EWS livery. I also have a 37 in um, Regional Railways livery, which is very nice. And I also acquired recently this one, which is a Class 37 in the old Intercity livery. Um, and that is 37431, which was the very last 37 to remain in intercity livery. So I don't know quite when it lost that livery. Um, I haven't quite tracked it down to an exact year yet. I think I have the information, I just haven't found it, and read it yet. Um, but I do know it was the last one. Um, so... I've got plenty of, because it was always 37 fours that operated the service, and the three I've just mentioned are 37 fours, 
I also have a 37.4 um, in large logo blue livery, which is my Loch Rannoch, which you've seen um, a few times, which is a, a hybrid of a Lima body on a Vitrain chassis. Um, so, a bit of regional railways is going to appear on this layout as well. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. Um, what I've been spending my time doing apart from eBay and buying a few things is um, I have actually been using my programming track, which is what you see beside, behind me here, which has the locos etc on it. It's my temporary programming track uh, uh, slung underneath canal sidings above my computer system. This is the computer and this is the, key, uh, the monitor that I actually use for, you can't really see much down there, but you've seen this bench before. And this is where I do my programming. Um, and that's where I run JMRI and set up all my CVs, etc. And get the locos running as best I can. Then I put them out on the main line and try them. And if there's anything wrong, I come back to the programming track and do a few tweaks. And I've been doing a bit of that recently. One loco that I recently again had problems with, I'll just pick it up. was this, which is my Class 153. Quite a nice model from Hornby, but it never ran well. It came DCC fitted, and I eventually got around to putting it on JMRI, and what I found in it was that. Um, probably won't focus, let me just put my hand behind it so that we can actually get a focus. That's a Hornby decoder. And it drives the motor like a dog. Horrible thing. I took it out, put in one of my DCC Concepts direct plug 8 pin. Instant, instant transformation. Runs like a dream. So, needs a little bit of probably adjustment for final low speed running etc. But, um, it's well on the way to being a much better loco now. Um, so that really is the extent of my modelling uh, over the time. But I've also been doing a lot of thinking about how I'm going to replace this layout, which as you know does go all the way around and along to the other end of the room, um, how to replace it. Um, because down here underneath it, I don't know, let me just turn the camera around a little bit and you'll be able to see a little better what I'm trying to talk about. Now I can't see what I'm looking at. Okay, yeah, we can see a little bit better now. Now I can't see where I am. But anyway, this area here, right down to the floor, and all the way along there, as far further than you can see, is where canal sidings is ultimately going to sit. I've got to get rid of these lumpy things that stick out from the wall, which is what stopped canal sidings from going back far enough last time. But that is where canal sidings will sit. And it, its height dictates that I'm fixed at track level here because I'm keeping quite a lot of the, the other layout. That dictates that I've only got about 110 millimetres from the top of canal sidings to the bottom of the track level on here. And I've got to span the whole length of canal sidings plus the extensions on the end, which uh, is about seven to eight feet. So I'll just turn the camera back again. How do I arrange to, I think I've got it back in the right place. How do I arrange to have a baseboard that I can work on that hangs in mid-air? It can't be an eight foot long baseboard, I'd never lift it. It's got, got to be two foot wide, and I say eight foot long. It's got to go in total 133 inches. So it's going to have to have some joins in it. And um, I can't support it off of canal sidings because canal sidings itself 
is has not uh, the, the top of Canal Side isn't strong. It was never built to be strong. It was never built to hold anything up. So, what I had decided to do right from the start was build a shelf which is fixed, which is just above canal sidings, which sits just above it, so there's enough clearance to move canal sidings in and out, but that's all. And then on, t on top of that shelf, which would then be strong and would be supported wherever I could manage to support it, um, on top of that would sit the baseboard. But that means that I can't get to the base of the baseboard, to the underside of it. I can't get to it anyway because canal sidings is in the way. So that baseboard that's got the track on it has got to be removable. And I've been having a lot of trouble lately with baseboards that I thought wouldn't be too heavy that actually are. Um, the baseboards of canal sidings are three foot by two foot. There are two of them. They're made of mostly MDF, not thick MDF, 6mm, 4mm, and they are just too heavy for me nowadays. I, I dread having to move them any distance. Taking them out and dropping them on a bench so I can work on them upside down is one thing. Having to move them around the room is something I really don't want to be doing. Even North Grove, which I bought as a lightweight baseboard, still comes out probably about 20 25 pounds and it's just too heavy to to wield I find um, so I decided that I would have to build these baseboards super light so that they're easy to move um, and um, are not going to cause me uh, back problems because there's going to be a lot of moving of them because I can't get to the bottom of them any other way and that's where all the wiring is going so I've been wanting for ages to build baseboards using very much a North American idea and an idea that I've tried to find people in this country who've got experience of and there seems to be very little of it out there but there's a lot of opinionated stuff that says oh foam is useless, it shrinks etc. But the Americans manage it and what they always do is seal it with what they call latex paint which is basically just emulsion. So what I'm going to use is this stuff. This is what you've seen me use before. This is actually the piece I cut, the, uh, the, the piece of foam that makes North Grove wider. This is two inches thick. It's four feet long. I can span four feet. Four feet long. So I'll just pop the lamp over. And this piece is 14 inches wide, but it weighs nothing. I can hold it up there in one hand. And I could hold it for ages because it's just very light. But it is super strong and doesn't buckle. You know, bending it is nearly impossible. It doesn't twist or bend. So, um, I've decided to use this stuff. As I say, there are American modellers that use it. And one of the great proponents of it is a guy who some of you must know out there, especially any of you guys who look at American practice, and that's Ken Patterson. Um, if you go to Model Railway, Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine's website, MRH, um, you will find references to the What's Neat uh, show. Uh, I think he used to call it What's Neat This Week. I think he now calls it What's Neat. But it's a video that's 40 to 45 minutes, made once a month by Ken Patterson. And he will talk about all sorts of new things that are out. Um, he does interviews with people. Um, and he shows his own layout and shows what he does on his own layout at times. He also does a weekly podcast, which is called the What's Neat This Week, I think. Uh, oh, I can't remember. Anyway, look up Ken Patterson and you'll find lots of references to him on the uh, on YouTube or What's Neat or Model Railroad Hobbyist. Um, and he's a guy who does a lot of uh, work with foam. And I bought a couple of videos from him. He sells videos as well. And one was a shelf layout. And one of the pieces of foam he used was 8 feet by 2 feet and he made a whole diorama working 
with track etc on it. He is DCC, the only thing he doesn't do is have um, electrically operated points. All his points are manually operated. I want my points with motors, servos. So um, it turns out that there is a servo mount now available as a, uh, a 3D printer file um, and um, I'm hoping to get some of those printed. I have a friend who uh, is, has a 3D printer and um, I'm trying to agree with him that he's not out of pocket but he prints them for me. He just is happy to print them um, but I shall need a few. Um, but they're very shallow, they only, they're only about 25 millimetres under the baseboard which will easily get hidden in two inches of foam. But of course you've got to cut a big square out of the foam to drop them into. Um, and I've been working out all sorts of ways of getting around uh, how to sort out the points um, and how to lay them on the track and how to be able to maintain them if for instance the servo fails or something comes loose on the servo or the point fails or the micro switch doesn't make any more in the right place that controls the polarity of the crossing. All sorts of things that you need to think about. Anyway, I've got a few ideas on that. Um, what I intend to do along that piece over there that I showed you earlier is I'm going to have two four foot by two foot baseboards and then two uh, an end section way down that end of the room that is a transition from the old baseboard to the foam and across here well right at the end I shall have an extension to the four foot by two foot however long it needs to be and then across here I'm going to use this piece of foam a bit like that I'm not sure exactly where yet and that is going to produce me two things it's going to produce me a uh, a section of baseboard which is low enough to put my programming track on and a raised track so that I can have a bridge like I've got already it'll just be a different bridge and the scenic section will go much further along here than this one does it won't stop there like this one does it will continue so my intention for the 4x2 uh, baseboards is that I need to slide on the shelf that I make so I'm going to use some of this stuff this is 12 millimeters by 30 something millimeters and I'm going to fit it light as a feather I'm going to fit it all the way around the edge of the underside of the baseboard and probably a couple of cross pieces as well that will allow it when I put it that's going to fall over now when I put on the shelf that will allow me to slide it easily in and out because that's the way it's going to be held up there. The, the sections are going to have edging around them, so I'm going to edge the whole thing in probably something like 3mm MDF. And I'm going to try and polish the edges of the 3mm so they will slide on one another easily. The baseboards will then be pushed to the back and they'll come to an absolute stop all the way along, which I'll adjust so that it's dead straight. So all the baseboards sit square to one another. And along the front, I will have a removable face here that you can actually put on. But then all the baseboards are held together fairly rigidly, um, but easily removable. And there'll just be a, an umbilical cord to each baseboard. And I've learned quite a lot about umbilical cords to baseboards since building canal sidings and North Grove. And I can almost certainly, if I'm really clever, uh, get away with... A couple of DCC connections and a 12 volt auxiliary connection. A couple of DCC buses and a 12 volt auxiliary connection. And the reason I say a couple of DCC buses is because I'm quite happy to power all the track on each baseboard from one DCC bus. But if the points require that DCC bus, and mine will for control, although they'll be running off the 12 volt auxiliary, the control pulses will get to them from DCC and if I end up trying to cross a point with the frog polarity wrong i.e. I come up against a point that is set the wrong way you get an instant short. It's all very well shorting out the bus for 
the locos, but if you short out the bus that has the control as well, then you can't then change that point and you can't move that loco. So now you're stuck having to reach across and do whatever you need to do. So that's why I'm looking at two DCC buses. They will be independently um, powered so that if one shorts out, it won't kill the other one. Um, normal way really of, of running DCC with uh, power districts as they call it in the States. So that, that, about half a dozen um, connections hopefully is all I'm going to need to each baseboard. Um, so it could be a, a, a nine way D connector or something like that. Um, and each baseboard will have its own power connector all coming from the same buses but uh, there will be no connections across the ends. I'm still working on how I'm going to do the points but mm, current thinking is that each point with its point motor and a piece of thin MDF, probably 3mm again, is going to be made into an assembly which you then drop into the correct size cutout in the 3mm cork and then simply slide some rail joiners onto it so that you've got a removable point stroke point motor assembly that can be already ballasted, already adjusted um, and ready to go and it would be easy to lift that out and sort out any problems with it. That's my current thinking, I haven't tried it yet, haven't even got a point motor yet but that will come. As far as making the shelf is concerned it's got to be not too thick but it's got to be very strong and I've got my son working on that. He is uh, he's a roof trust designer in the building trade. Um, he works on computers all day and he knows pretty much everything there is to know about wood. Um, and he's got programs that he said he can run and we can try uh, certain pieces of wood and they're all different grades of timber that you can buy. And he said, we can, I'm sure we can buy a grade of timber that won't be too thick um, that we can ensure will not sag um, and will be uh, will, will be happy to be supported only um, at, at seven or eight feet intervals. So that's something I'm looking into. Um, before I can do any of that, I've got to do a drawing of the kind of thing I want. And before I do that, I've got to move all the crap that's down here, which is still part of the room move. Um, when I built this bench behind me, which you've seen before, if you haven't, then you know look at earlier videos. My technology bench, as I called it. Um, I had to move things out and I moved canal sidings out, it's now in the garage and it's purpose built. Um, but you can't run it in, it just uh, keeps it clean. Um, and uh, the, the stuff down here is all that. Um, so, that's all I've been doing, a lot of thinking, a lot of playing with locos and DCC decoders. Um, I have to say, have found Hornby standard decoders. I'm not talking Hornby TTS here. I'm talking standard Hornby decoders, R8, whatever they are, um, XXX, uh, to be absolute and utter rubbish. I've never found a loco that runs smoothly with a Hornby mobile decoder, as they call them, in it. So I would never buy Hornby decoders. A lot of people seem to get on with them. Um, not me. TTS decoders, okay. Hornby have got an algorithm in there that apparently is supposed to be close to what lens use. Um, not got any lens decoders. In fact, that's not true. Do have one lens decoder. Um, bought a loco from eBay recently, which had a lens decoder in it. Just trying to think what loco it was. Oh yes, I bought a three car uh, 170 turbo unit and it had already been DCC fitted well actually it hadn't um, somebody had hardwired a lens decoder to the motor and what it meant was when you put it on a DCC track all the lights at both ends came on so you had front and rear lights on together both ends so it wasn't really DCC fitted it needed two more decoders um, but when I put the centre car on the track and tried it it ran like a dream until I tried to stop it as soon as I went to speed step zero, it just carried on at whatever the previous speed step has been. And the only way to stop it was emergency stop. 
So there's a fault in that decoder. I plugged in, uh, I sort of plugged in, I wired in one of my standard wired decoders. It was actually a Lay's DCC decoder. Works perfectly. So I did have a lens decoder and it seemed to drive the motor nicely. But it had a fault on it which means I couldn't use it anyway. Um, but they're the sort of things that you get. I did get a, a refund from eBay for three decoders that I had to fit in it for 30 quid. Um, the guy was very understanding about it and I was happy with to, to, to accept a partial refund on the product because it wasn't as described really because it wasn't fully DCC fitted. Anyway, um, that's enough from me. Uh, hopefully I will be back with some modelling soon. Um, I've probably got about another three weeks, maybe a little longer, but probably about three, maybe four weeks of eBay selling to do. And then I'm finished with all that and I can get on with building my railway again and I can't wait. I am feeling great withdrawal symptoms from being able to just do a bit of modelling without anything hanging over me like has this loco arrived, has this wagon got delivered, why is this person telling me he doesn't like this or oh dear why has this person not paid me yet. Just such hard work eBay I think and I'll be glad when I'm finished with it. I will have sold about probably 60 lots by the time I'm finished um, and that's enough for me. Anyway, so thanks for watching and hopefully I'll be back fairly soon. Bye.